alone save sinners from hell. Amen? Amen? So if you're here and you're a visitor, that's what we're all about. We hope you are, are blessed in our midst. If you're a regular, uh, open up with us to Exodus 12. as We're continuing a series. If you're a visitor, I hope you stick along for the series. It's an indefinitely long series because there's so much about this series. It is topical in nature. We are looking at the blood of Jesus Christ in the Bible. And it is uh, not right to just go to the cross of the Lord Jesus and start there at about 33 AD or so to start studying the blood because the cross of Jesus, the bloodletting atonement of Jesus, the sprinkling of Jesus, the shedding of Jesus' blood did not appear out of thin air. It, it is the answer to millennia of mystery and prophecy and shadow and foretelling and type. The cross of Jesus appears as a culmination where a hundred thousand different threads are picked up by the, by the grand weaver's hands and twisted into the cross. But those, weave, those, those, those threads have started to be sewn and threaded into the biblical story since the beginning of the Bible. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 12 tonight as we consider the blood and how Jesus' blood enables God's wrath to pass over us. We established last week in the, uh, uh, the absolute necessity of blood in our religion. Now, this is very different from uh, occultic religion or Old Testament uh, sacrificial religion or from modern pagan, ancient or modern pagan religions or Islam, which is a religion of blood, not merely in sacrifice, but in jihad and murder and violence. We have a bloody religion, not just because some woke professor can tell you that in the medieval ages there was, you know, the Inquisition and there was the Crusades, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? We have a bloody religion because at the core of our belief, at the core of our doctrine, at the core of our hope is blood sacrifice that releases us, that redeems us, that spares us from the wrath of God against us for our sin. And we established last week that therefore, since the earliest days of the book of Genesis, the earliest book in the Bible, since as soon as sin came into the world, God showed to his people, at that point there was only two of them, Adam and Eve, who by faith believed God's promise for a future one to come and crush the head of the serpent and the tempter. God said to his people then, I will give to you a covering, I will give to you a clothing, we remember this, from the animal. He took the skin off the animal and put it onto them. And in doing so, he shed blood, the first blood that was ever shed. And we saw that because of God's promise that in the day you, that you eat of the fruit, Adam, you will die. But Adam didn't die. We see that the death of the animal was in place of Adam. It was a substitutionary blood sacrifice. Even though the word blood is not there. Even though the word sacrifice is not there. The threads have begun to be spun for God to unravel for us and show to us the fullness of his divine mystery in the cross of Jesus Christ. It was from that point on that we looked at Cain and we understood from the earliest days of Genesis, though it wasn't written down for us in Genesis, though we weren't shown some kind of inscripturation that Adam was carrying about, it was a, a part of the ancient psyche from the moment that God shed the blood of the animal for Adam and Eve it was in their awareness from then on that any proper religion, any proper worship, any proper relationship with the true creator God must be based on blood sacrifice. We see this in the earliest days. There was a religious controversy. There was four people in the world and there was already a religious controversy. There you go. Between, Adam, between Abel and Cain. Cain offered his crops in sacrifice to God and he gave much and he gave of his goods and he gave of his skills and he gave. God wasn't happy with it. Abel was a farmer of animals and he gave animal blood sacrifices and God was happy. I wonder if you have ever thought about why was God unhappy with one and happy with the other and how could he have expected him to know that he preferred animal sacrifices? He hadn't read Leviticus yet, it wasn't written. The reason is this, that because as soon as God had showed that to Adam and Eve, it was then a part of their psyche, a part of their mantra, a part of their acknowledgement that sin costs life. Sin is paid for with life. God is so holy. Our sin is so severe that the only way it can, it can, the, the chasm between us and God can be breached is through blood. The only way is through blood. That is how serious sin is. And that is the blasphemy and the heresy of Cain. Cain came to God saying, you're overreacting. 
Sin's not that serious. You're not that holy. Crops will do. Burning grain will do. You don't need life. My sin is not that guilty. I'm not that bad. You will accept crops. When God had said, I require life for sin. And life is paid through the transaction of death. Therefore, from the earliest pages of Scripture, as soon as sin is in the world, blood must be shed in the world if God will be forgiving sin and relating to mankind. We could go to many instances throughout the book of Genesis where God shows to us through history, through prophecy, through imagery or through analogy and allegory how, how God was involving blood in the religion of Abraham and the Jews and even in the instance of Noah, etc. But tonight we're going to go to probably the bloodiest of days, one of the bloodiest scenes in the earliest books of the Bible and that is in Exodus chapter 12. We've alluded to it already. That is the day the scene, the night, the event of the Passover. If you're familiar with your Bible, you know what happens here. If you are unfamiliar, we will do some explaining. But look first at verse 13 from where we get our core and our key idea. In fact, go to verse 12. Chapter 12 and verse 12 and 13. Is our core verse for the night. God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. May God bless an understanding and a reflection upon this passage in our midst this evening. God says in this passage, as, as, as we will explain the historical details, God says a very important thing in verse 13. The blood is a sign for you, Israel, to give you a message, to give you confidence, to give you a symbol of hope and peace. It is also a sign for me. A sign that the covenant has been ratified. A sign that you people have fulfilled the sacrificial necessity of blood. This is our consideration tonight. How the blood is a sign for us. And how the blood of Jesus is a sign also unto God and what that means. We have to understand this. Why the blood? What is the blood that he's talking about? Uh, After... God flooded the world in, in Noah's day. Uh, they repopulated after Noah's generation. They repopulated the earth after coming out of the ark. Some settled here, some settled there. Some went down to Egypt, some went across to Arabia, some up into Europe, some into what became Iraq. And some of those that settled were the Shemites. And from them, some of them worshipped Baal. And they were Babylonians or they were Chaldeans in the desert of Ur. And there was one pagan that God selected out and said, I'm going to choose you, forgive you, save you. And from you, I'm going to create an enormous nation eventually. And I'm going to show my blessings to the whole world through them, especially to one offspring that will come. He's the same offspring I promised to Eve, the crusher of the serpent's head, Jesus Christ, my son. That's me paraphrasing. God didn't say all of that to Abraham. So I'm going to pick you. I'm going to save the world through one of your descendants. But in the meantime, I'm going to make a nation out of you. But there is, a, there is, a, there is an interim point. Abraham, your family for 400 years are going to go down into Egypt. They will be captive. They will be slaves. They will suffer. But I will deliver them with my strong right hand. That's warrior language. For I will take my sword and I will smite the enemies that hold them. I will save them. God allowed a fall so that he could be the savior. He allowed a slavery so that he could be the redeemer. He told that to Abraham and sure enough, as the years go by, it is his great grandchildren who are then enslaved in Egypt. They moved there on peaceful passage. They, they camped and were nomads in sort of the uh, 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 Goshen area, a nice rich area. But as they, throw, they thrived and they grew and they multiplied, uh, they, they were then uh, taken as slaves. They were uh, subjugated and they were stolen. Many of them murdered their children, thrown to the alligators and sacrificed to their pagan gods and so on. And so, so and so forth. Then, in that instance, God raises up a hero, a champion, a sinner, a fool. His name was Moses. He was a sinner, and yet he was God's chosen sinner to bring salvation to Israel through God's mighty right hand. This was the fulfillment of the promise God had spoken to Abraham. 
And he was chosen to be raised as a prince, but then also be an outcast. And then eventually come back to Egypt and he would uh, lead the Israelites into uh, release out of Egypt into the land that God had first promised Abraham. This is all sounding great. But God did not just want to remove uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. He wanted to stomp the heads of the serpentine gods in Egypt. He wanted to strip the Egypt out of the souls of the Israelites. He wanted to show himself and flex his strength with his strong right arm against the gods of Egypt and then rescue his people out of the carcasses and out of the dead bodies and corpses of those pathetic pagan gods of Egypt. That is what God did. And so systematically, God starts basically going through their philosophy and their pagan gods. And he says, oh, you've got a God of sun. I'm going to send a plague of darkness. Oh, you've got a God of the Nile. I'm going to send a plague of blood in your Nile. Oh, you've got a God of livestock. I will kill all of your livestock. Oh, you've got a God of this and that. I will send destruction and plagues, not just upon you, Egyptians, for ruling over my people, for abusing my people, for subjugating my people, and agreeing in joy with Pharaoh's tyrannical rule. But I will judge the demons that rule over you, whom you worship as gods. That's what God was doing. And after nine plagues, the Israelites had kind of been, had kind of been watching. Uh, uh, I mean, Queenslanders do this at a state of origin. You'll get together, you sit back, maybe big screen, you have your snacks, and you watch the slaughter, right? You just watch the victory transpire in front of you. This is what the Israelites have been doing. They had no reason to fear the, the gnats or the, the flies or, or this or, or the darkness. Israel and their little area was, was, was immune. They were God's people. But the 10th plague changed things. In the 10th plague, the Israelites were not immune from the plague for being Israelites. In the 10th plague, they were going to be judged along with the, along with the Egyptians because now the distinction that God was making was not Egypt and Israel. He was not making a distinction between Egypt and Israel. It was not an ethnic distinction. It was not a racial distinction. It was not a nationality distinction. It was not a descendant distinction. It had nothing to do with that. The one distinction he was making was between those sheltered under blood, whatever your color or race, and those who thought they could survive God's wrath without the blood, regardless of your race, either an Israelite or an Egyptian. This night, God was not merely judging the Egyptians for abusing the Israelites. He was judging humans for worshipping demons. And the Israelites were just as guilty. We learn later on in the book of Exodus that part of what God has to train out of the Israelites is what they learned after four centuries in Egypt, which was to worship the Egyptian gods along with Abraham's gods. They had themselves become stained with blood guilt and idolatry. And therefore, when God arrived to Exodus, with the, uh, to Egypt rather, with, with the great guillotine of his justice, and said, everybody who worships false demon gods, come to the block of judgment and be decapitated under my wrath. The Israelites were also called to pay for their iniquity. The psalmist says, O Lord, if you should count iniquity, who could stand? And it's a rhetorical question. Don't put your hand up. When God really starts accounting, not just between Egyptian and Israelite, not just between oppressor and oppressed, not just between tyrant and victim, but between sinners and perfectly righteous, all of us line up in the guilty, condemned, sinful, deserving of death line. And so we see this again. Let me show you in Exodus 12 verse 12. I will, pass, I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt. All. Not just Egyptians. Everybody in the land of Egypt. That's Israelite family and non-Israelite family. In fact, he goes so universal that he says, uh, I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Even your firstborn puppy is going to die. Even your firstborn oxen and donkey and sheep, they're going to die. The firstborn of every class, of every kind, of every animal, human and other, will perish. The firstborn, the first son that opens the womb of the mother, will die. As God brought down his payment, and even in that we say, what a mercy. He was only going to kill the firstborn. I hope you're not like Cain 
and you're not sitting over here and thinking, man, he, he, he goes, goes again, just overreacting, wanting more blood. One child out of every household and every father and every uncle that you have and every grandfather who is a firstborn was going to die. How dramatic. I hope you see with the eyes of Scripture and the law of God and say he was only going to kill one, one per family. Every child of every woman should be slaughtered, including the mothers themselves, not just the first. But God was merciful and said, I'm going to kill one son, the eldest son, the inheriting son, the son that represents the future of the nation. That is how the ancients viewed their firstborns. And each of them would die, Israelite and Egyptian alike, even the animals. God, it says here at the end of verse 12, when I... On all, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. So why was Israel and Egyptians required to bring blood? Because they were guilty. They were guilty along with the Egyptians. They were guilty in idol worship. They were guilty. They were condemned. They needed to bring blood to God because of that guilt. I wonder where you are tonight. Have you tried to excuse your guilt? Have you come to a place at some point in your life and stayed there? Have you come to a point where you realized, I am more guilty than I could ever fathom? Not just guilty of social sins, of sinning against other people. I'm guilty of eternal sins because I sin against God. In fact, I don't even need to consider my sins against people. They almost don't matter when I just consider the sins against God. That's enough. That's enough to condemn me forever. I am rightly, righteously, justly, fairly condemned, guilty, and deserving of an eternal hell through which I will remain awake and conscious to my torment and pain in every cell and to which there will never be an end. That is what I deserve. Have you come to that place? If you have not, you are not a Christian and you're not going to heaven. I've met pastors who say that's all a bit much. You know, we, we pay off God eventually. You know, it, it's this and it's that. And there's these Old Testament notions of punishment and eternality. It's not all of that. They're not saved. And they'll experience, they, they, will, they will realize how wrong they are in the burning. And it will be too late. You recognize that you are guilty of eternal sins. That you are finally and absolutely condemned with no hope of obfuscation. The judge sitting in the, in the judge's seat is no fool. You cannot trick him. You cannot beg for mercy and, and say, oh, but my circumstances and, and I was raised this way and the examples I had and, and was there really enough support for me in the community? He's not, not that kind of judge. He will give to you exactly what you deserve. But I'm asking you, have you come to that point in your life where you have realized beyond any shadow of a doubt, if God gave you what you deserve today, you would go to an eternal hell? We must. We must. That is why in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5 and 6, look over to those verses. <coughs> they needed blood because they were all guilty. And because they were all guilty, they needed spotless blood. Look at chapter 12, verse 5 and 6. The lamb that they were supposed to take and, and, and shed in their place had to be, verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male, a year old. Oh, this is the most valuable lamb in the flock. This is a perfect lamb. Not mutated, not a bung leg, not a bad eye, not a spot on its wool. The, the most precious wool, the most valuable lamb, the thing that could get you the most money if you kept it and bred it, that one you have to give. What a great cost. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. The sacrifice, look further at, um, at verse 7. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it into do, they should put it onto the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. That is that they were to, it explains later on in other verses, that they were to bleed the animal into a bowl. By this point, I mean, if you've had kids, you know it doesn't take them very long to, uh, to bond with animals. Give them about three seconds with a fly, cockroach, rat, anything, dead bird, my boys, dead bird, already dead, in the park. They named it, okay? They were playing with it. I left them out of my sight for three seconds. Dad, look, it's birdie. It's dead. Bonding. 
Here's what God commanded the Israelites. Take a lamb, the cutest one, a male old, a male a year old, the most perfect one. Bring it into your household. Let the kids meet it. Let them name it. Because it's going to become part of you. That's what makes it a sacrifice. It has to represent you. It needs to smell like your son. The one who would die, if that lamb didn't die, let him play with it. Let him identify with it. Let him put his hand upon it and and even name it. Let him relate to it because it will be him in its death. And then a week later on the 14th, the father called the family, put them down in front of Birdie Lammy or whatever they called it, and and then he bled it in front of them. And you think, well, this is a bit much, isn't it? This is too gory. This is old-fashioned. This is what God requires. Don't be too squeamish for the gospel. Now, if you're going to be squeamish, be squeamish about your sin and stop doing it. But don't be squeamish about the solution that God brings. And so he bleeds it into bowls. They're collecting blood into bowls. They put the carcass aside. They will eat parts of it later. They pick up the blood and using some uh, 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 strands of... of, of, uh, 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 leaves, they then paint it onto the side posts on the outside of their doors. They paint it onto the outside and across the top so that in an archway over their household and over their doorway is a painting, a, a doorway of blood. Anybody who goes in, goes in under the blood. Anybody who leaves is leaving the doorway of the blood and is now outside the blood. This is what must happen. A perfect, unblemished, spotless, pure white lamb. And it's at this point that Peter, a disciple of Jesus, a friend of Jesus, a witness to the crucifixion of Jesus, wrote this in verse 18 and 19 of his first epistle. He says, you were ransomed from the futile ways you inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The family had to identify with it so that it was a personal sacrifice. It's a representative sacrifice. But the family also had to keep it with them for a week because it might appear perfect at first, but under closer scrutiny has a limp. Under closer scrutiny, you see some teeth out of place. You see your crooked nose and you realize, oh, this is not a perfect unblemished lamb. Get rid of it, bring another. And in the same vein and for the same reason, Jesus In the week prior to his death and crucifixion as the Passover lamb, he entered into Jerusalem and day by day by day, he was assessed, he was tested, he was tempted, he was criticized, he was looked at. People literally were trying to gather as little bands of conspirators saying, find something out about him that is imperfect so that we can kill him. Trick him into blasphemy. Do something to make him sin so that we can can get him. And they assessed him and they watched him, that household of Israel. And they looked upon him and they found no spot or blemish. So that even pagan Pilate ended up washing his hands and saying, I have found no guilt in this man. He was assessed like the Passover lamb was to be assessed. And therefore his blood was spotless blood. That is sinless blood. If we remember back to the concept that we were saying last week, that blood is not merely the red liquid. Blood is representative of life. And that blood life is truly representative of the the value of human life. So that when we say there was spotless blood, what we mean was that there was perfect, sinless life value in Jesus. That is what Jesus offered up. That is what Peter says has ransomed us from our slavery, from our tyranny to under sin, and from the control of the devil. What ransomed us, what was shed for us, what died in our place and was gushed out for all to see. All those who would be saved by it must look upon the death of the lamb. That lamb was Jesus and the blood that gushed from his veins in the whipping before Calvary, in the pinning of the nails upon Calvary, in the pierced brow of the crown at Calvary. What the blood was showing was that there is a spotless, perfect, not nearly perfect, absolutely perfect and sinless, moral, righteous blood, person's life shed for you. This is why it is such an insult when you try and come to God with anything you've done to try and pay off any one of your sins. 
What a, what a disgusting insult it is to Jesus, who alone has spotless blood. Like, I know you're a good neighbor, maybe, tremendous employee or employer, you're a great spouse, you're a tremendous child, whatever, whatever boast you may have, let it be true, you're not spotless. Nothing you've produced. The most, the most spotless church attendance record, none of is it unstained by sin. Nothing you've ever produced is without blush, without blot or blemish or spot. All of it is tainted by the crimson a, 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 a staining of your own sin coming from your own heart. But Jesus provided that which was absolutely, perfectly spotless. If you have realized your guilt, therefore, if you've come to understand that blood must be shed, then please, you must forsake any pursuit, any pursuit to produce something that can pay off your sin. Some people are caught in this deadly vice grip. They say, I acknowledge I'm guilty. My sin deserves blood. My life is my cost and payment for my guilt. And here I am upon this earth trying to figure out what I can do to make that payment cut it. It's a dreadful thing as a pastor to see. Some young people have told me that they self-harm for this reason, to pay off their sin. Some people tell me that the reason they binge drink is to pay off through suffering their sin. Some people tell me they're paying good out into the universe to try and receive some good from the karmic uh, 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 yin-yang eventually. People are caught with this idea. Biblically, my sin deserves death and can only be paid by blood. And then they commit the heresy and the self-destructive folly of thinking something they can produce can amount to that blood. And there's nothing. This is good news. There's nothing God will ever demand of you to pay the blood price because there's nothing you can pay. And he's already made it paid in the perfect, unblemished, spotless blood of Jesus. Of Jesus, not your blood. God requires your blood, and you will pay your blood in death and hell. But if you want to be saved, then it's not your blood. You are damned by your blood. You are cursed by your blood. You are condemned by your blood. But you are saved by Jesus' blood and no intermingling of yours and his. His blood and his blood alone is able to make a payment that is without blemish and without spot before God. The blood of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5.7, Paul says this. Christ... Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. He makes this explicit. It's not just analogy that I'm saying, hey, look at the scene in the Old Testament. Doesn't it remind you, Jesus? No, no, I'm quoting the Apostle Paul when we say Christ is the true and better, the actual, the proper, the infinitely efficient and effectual Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover lamb. How pathetic our attempts are then to save ourselves. Wouldn't you think it, 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 I mean, if you were an Israelite and you were told all of this, and Moses did tell them, and they said, you know the God that's just been booting the teeth out of every Egyptian God? He's coming for you. He's done it nine times against all of those and you got to watch, but now he is turning in his vehemence and his wrath against us. You happy? This is a good holiday. You know, we started out this chapter saying, this shall be a holiday for you and a festival. I'm going to kill you. All right. It says, oh, there, 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 there's an exemption. Like you can escape the wrath under the blood. But, but, but if you were to, to have seen in, in your own flesh, with your own eyes, the death of the tens of thousands of the Egyptians, the greatest superpower upon all the earth, their cattle, their Nile, their soldiers, their, 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 their people, everything, hail, gnats, flies, animals, blood in the water, it's all been destroying this nation around you. And then God says, and now I'm coming for you. And, and you ask, and Moses tells you, how do I escape that wrath? What can stand between us? Oh, a thin layer of goat blood. A thin layer of a year old sheep blood. That'll do it. If you know your sin, then that feels infinitely insufficient. And it is a tremendous act of faith that says, I trust God's word and not what I see by my eyes. I trust God's promise, not what seems evident to me. 
I'm going to live by faith now, not by sight, because I don't see how a thin layer of hemoglobin is able to protect me from God, Yahweh, the Lord, holy in his justice. So it was an act of faith to sprinkle that blood. It seemed quite silly to sit inside that house and, and trust the blood. It seemed quite illogical. It seemed like it required a great deal of faith to trust the blood up on the... I, I wonder if you, like me, I, I got to admit, like me, if you would have been tempted to maybe just grab a couple of extra padlocks, just throw them on for good measure, just in case, maybe barricade up the windows with some timber as well. I mean, timber's not going to stop God, but, but it's better than blood. Maybe, maybe your faithlessness would have shown in that, and that you fear God's wrath enough to try more things. Maybe you hid under the bed. Maybe you put the furniture up against the, the wall like in those zombie movies or, or you just went right at it and plastered the whole window and put stones upon, you, upon your door because blood didn't seem like enough. But that, that's what we do with our religious good works. We're told by God, Christ, the Passover lamb has been sacrificed and the blood shedding of that one afternoon by that one man is enough to save you and everybody you could ever imagine seeing. That many people and thousands more that many people in all of their hell and all of their eternity consumed and absorbed and paid for entirely by a few liters gushing out of a single man one afternoon 2,000 years ago. You say, that doesn't seem like it cuts it. <laughs> no, 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 no. That doesn't seem like it's yet enough. I don't see something in front of me that looks tangible to hold back God's wrath. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give money to the church. There's an extra padlock on that door. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll go to lots of conferences and make sure I get lots of the spirit juice to keep me going. There's another padlock on that door. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do some penance. I'll make myself bleed when I sin. I'll, I'll make myself suffer when I've done evil. There's another few padlocks on the door. I'll tell you what, I'll go to church every single time I remember. There's the furniture pushed up against the door. I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll go on some kind of a, a pilgrimage. I'll go to the Holy Land. I'll, I'll swim in the Jordan River. I'll, I'll go to Mecca, for goodness. I'll go to the Hindu's promised land. I'll go wherever I need to go as long as there is something in front of me, imageable, uh, visible, right there, tangible, that tells me I'm saved from the wrath of God. But the wrath of God is not stopped by any of those things. Your own good works, your own religious deeds, your own hopes at doing something is just padlocking a door against the God who created every atom and every cos cosmic uh, 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 galaxy in the universe. It's nothing to stop it. Blood in itself, even the blood of Jesus, that is the physical red juice that came out of his veins, that blood does nothing to stop God's wrath against your sin. The reason that blood is able to stop God's wrath, shield you from God's wrath, and make God's wrath pass over you is because in that blood was the value of not only the great lamb, but also the great firstborn son. The reason that blood is able to save you is not because its hemoglobin had spiritual power, but because God had promised that in the shedding of that blood, I will pass over you. God, God, God joins to the blood of Jesus, the blood shedding sacrifice, his covenantal promise to pay there in Jesus our sins and then never require that payment of us. We may think we could add more things to, to the blood of Jesus to keep us safe, but no, the blood of Jesus is all we need because the blood of Jesus is not merely the blood of a man. It is the blood of God's firstborn son. And on that day of Calvary, it wasn't as if a lamb died so the firstborn son didn't need to die. It's not as if Jesus brought a lamb so that he didn't need to die as God's firstborn. It is that Jesus brought himself as the lamb and he died both as the firstborn and as the lamb. Therefore, the lamb's blood was filled with divine, godly human power in order to save us. That's what happened on Passover. That's what happened on the true Passover, not, not the Exodus Passover. The Passover that came 1,500 years later in the presence of Jesus upon the cross. That is why when Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed, He's pulling together and clarifying many threads that come to us through the scriptures. You see, they were told in Exodus, they were told to kill the lambs uh, before twilight or at twilight, you shed the blood. That is about 6 p.m. That is, that, that is a, a, around about the time upon which the day changes. It's now nighttime or in the Jewish calendar, it's now really the next day before twilight. 
At twilight, as the sun was going down, they would kill the animals. Jesus was tried Thursday night into Friday morning. He was uh, tortured and uh, beaten. He was led to the cross. He was put on the cross and he stayed there. And they removed his dead body before the Sabbath started at sundown, which was twilight. That is that as Jesus was hanging on the cross at the very hour, Jerusalem was running red with the blood of the Passovers. The Passover lambs being sacrificed, screaming out throughout Jerusalem. Their their little lamb, one-year-old voice crying in death as Jesus cried out and gave up his spirit to God. He was the fulfillment of the Passover prophecy. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, as they are portioning up the dead lamb to then eat it together in communion and community. They are told, don't break any bones, which is a weird rule because it's dead now. Why not? That is a weird rule. I mean, God said it, so they had to obey it and they did it unless they were cursed, but that's odd. They were even told how to dispose of the bones, etc. I mean, that's weird. If I come over to your house, I'm enjoying food and I bring a turkey or a chicken, I'm not insulted that you break any of the bones. In fact, you know, in there is all the good stuff, the marrow. That's, that's the good stuff. Why, oh, why did God command, do not break the bones? It had nothing to do with Passover. It had nothing to do with the 1,500 following Passovers that would come before Jesus came. It had everything to do with the final Passover, the Passover lamb, which was Christ on the cross. The do not break their bones was simply a secret that would make no sense until John wrote in chapter 18 that when the soldiers came to break the bones of the dying criminals on the crosses, they said, oh, look, this one's already dead. Let's not break his bones. And then the writers could say, and this was to fulfill that ancient, mystic, cryptic command, do not break the Passover lamb's bones. Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 12, we are told this. God says, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you. That is to say, if we speak in Jesus' terms now, Jesus' blood is a sign to you and it is a sign to God. Jesus' blood is a sign to you saying, you deserve to die. Sin, the wages of sin is death. Or in the language of blood, the language of sin is blood. The language of sin is the cost of your life. Because you're a sinner, Jesus' blood was shed. So Jesus' blood says to you, you're a, you're a guilty sinner. You are condemned. There is no way out of this on your own. Only in Christ is there salvation. And God has provided that salvation for you, free and full, in the cross of Calvary where Jesus died. It also says to you, Christ is spotless. When we sing of the cross, when we read about the cross, when the apostles explain the cross, when I preach about the cross, when you think about the cross, when you pray and picture the cross as as a scene upon which Jesus died, every time you think of the cross and the blood of Jesus, remember that that red blood tells you that Jesus is spotless. Jesus was without sin. And despite all of the sin that you've committed and will commit, you have a spotless representative before God. You have blood shed, which is righteous where you were not. You have something valuable in front of God, which pays for you, though you had nothing that you could have brought. The blood of Jesus also speaks to God. The blood of Jesus pleads with God. It is as if, as God comes over each and every one of our souls, and He looks upon us, when He sees the faith that has received Jesus Christ, He sees blood that has been put upon the doorposts. He has seen the faith that hides in the house. And just like it says in Exodus, they dared not go out of it lest they die. When God looks upon you and he sees that you have fled to Jesus Christ for repose, that you've held on to Jesus Christ for redemption and salvation, that you've received and painted Jesus' blood over your soul, when God sees that soul, that that blood upon your soul, it is a sign to him to pass his wrath over you and never make you pay an ounce for your sin. 
Never pay an ounce for your sin. The blood of Jesus is a sign to God. It's as if Jesus is saying, They are sons of Adam and Cain, but I am your firstborn son. Though they are sinners, I am perfectly spotless, Father. Though they could never pay, I have paid perfectly. Though they have kindled your wrath, I have covered them in my death. I have covered them in my life. Therefore, Father, pass over them. The only distinction that God makes as he looks down on souls is not color, age, background, or outward religion. He looks at this. Are you under the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you sprinkled it upon yourself and shed it upon yourself as an act of faith that though it doesn't seem like much of a single man dying on one afternoon, yet I trust my entire soul and all my sin and my eternal future to him? Have you done that? Exodus 12 verse 13 speaks of one day in history, the day of the Passover. Look at what it says. God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This fateful last phrase pins God's promise of mercy to that single night. And in doing so, it makes the entire story of the Passover a tragedy. God promised that the Israelites would receive mercy under that blood for one night only. They were saved. They received the mercy. God's wrath passed over them. But the next morning, as they woke, as they left, as they fled into the, into the wilderness, through the Red Sea eventually, they were now outside from under the blood, and their sin still hung over them. God's promise of of mercy to Egypt after the Lamb's blood was pinned to that one night. The tragedy of the history of the Old Testament tells us that almost all of those who were saved under the Lamb's blood at Passover ended up dying under the wrath of God in the wilderness and presently reside in hell. That Lamb's blood of Passover only covered them for one night's wrath. They just got to hell later. But the blood of Jesus saves us from that day when God's wrath is poured out on all people, not in the land of Egypt, but in all the land over all history, when God's wrath is finally kindled to the nth degree, the final day of God's judgment is poured out and human history is ended and human nations are wrapped up like a scroll and all human history is forgotten behind us and we just see God coming back in justice on that day when His wrath pours out on all Only the blood of Jesus and no lambs, bulls or goats is going to be able to save you. Will you have a covering? Will you be under the blood of Jesus? Will you be sprinkled with his blood on that day? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 tells us, God has not destined us believers for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, Believe, plead, cling to the blood of Jesus alone for your salvation and rejoice in him the rest of your life if you have received it. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for being spotless. You told God in your high priestly prayer that it was for the sake of your followers you kept yourself holy, that your consecration would be shared with us and what good news it is that you withheld up against temptation. You held up against the tyranny and the attacks of Satan. You were reviled by a mob. You were stripped naked, a plucked beard. You had a mockery of a sign put above your head. You were mistreated and you never once had the slightest inkling of human sinful revenge. God, you are in Jesus Christ. You have shown yourself to be greater and more majestic and wonderful than we could ever imagine. We could not imagine this kind of sinless human existence, but in Jesus you have manifested it. We could never produce such a righteousness, but in Jesus there is an unblemished blood supply. There is a spotless lamb. Father God, thank you for giving to us your firstborn son so that every single one of us could be redeemed. Thank you for the way you've woven scripture together. But we ask tonight that the mercy 
of the blood of Jesus would not be wasted as it was wasted upon that first generation who merely took, pla- took refuge under the blood of a lamb. We ask that the good news of the message being painted up over us in front of us tonight would not be avoided, would not be rejected, would not be, would not be a, a, a missed by souls here tonight, but anyone and everyone who is still here, who does not yet believe on, or who didn't when they walked in, may they already right now be believing and rejoicing in their soul that there is blood for them, there is life for them, there is a death in their place, there is a saviour for them. Lord God, you have not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. May it be so in our midst tonight by your Holy Spirit. We pray all of this in your Son's name. And everyone said...